So recently, I came across an article published by the World Economic Forum titled The 10 Skills Needed to Survive in the Age of Automation. And these are some of the skills listed. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity. Oh, you know, something new, people management. Like who doesn't know that? So I try to make more sense of this by grouping it into two different categories. And I realized that you could actually group half of them to be inner oriented or topics on how to think better. And you could orient the other half on outside oriented or how to treat others better or how to interact with other people better. So I asked myself, would it be nice if somebody could actually take the time and make more sense of these abstract concepts and skills? And that's why I made this video on how to stay relevant in the age of automation. In this video, we'll be focusing on judgment and decision making under the how to think better category. And I'll be making heavy reference to my very favorite book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. At times, we make decisions that go against what we would consider as rational, which creates awkward moments and even moments that we would end up regretting for the rest of our lives. For this reason, I would like to help you understand the thought process that goes behind decision making to rid yourself of all these awkward moments and to help you make the best decision at all times. So, there are three questions that I'm trying to answer through this video. The first is, why do we make such stupid decisions at times? Second is, do we enjoy pleasure as much as we dislike pain? And how does this actually uh, filter in in our decision making process? And third is understanding that there are two cells within us and understanding that these two cells have different interests. To begin with, let's ask the question, what makes us make such stupid decisions at times? What makes us make? In order to understand this, I'll show you two pictures. So this is the first picture. This is the second picture. Now your mind did something completely different when you saw each one of these pictures. And let me try to explain what happened. Kahneman explains this in what he it defines as system one and system two. Those are two systems in your brain. So system one is the intuitive part. It's fast, it's quick, and it comes in like a wrecking ball with like Miley Cyrus. It just comes right at you. It's like the Tasmanian devil of your thought. It just jumps to a conclusion and you instinctively know what that is. So this first picture, when you see this, this woman, you see intuitively that she's pissed about something. Maybe her son spilled apple juice on the rug. I don't know, but you just know by looking at her face that she looks really angry about something. And that was, it didn't, you didn't have to think about that. It just was instinctive. Now, when you saw the second equation, something else different happened. You, it wasn't intuitive. You, you didn't know the answer to this question in like a matter of seconds like you did to the image with the pissed woman. It took time. You need to actually think. Maybe your palms got a bit sweaty because uh, seeing this got your brains all shriveled up or something. So you can clearly see that there are two different ways that your brain functions. System one is intuitive and it goes straight to the point, whereas system two is deliberate and it takes time for things to process. So the reason why we make stupid decisions at times is because our system one jumps to a conclusion or an ir irrational conclusion, or system two is unable to stop system one from making that decision. Okay, let me say that one more time. The reason why we make stupid decisions at times is because our system one jumps to an irrational conclusion or because system two, the deliberate system two, is unable to control the irrationality of system one jumping to a crazy conclusion. So let's try to understand why this is so. So the first question is, why does system one jump to an irrational conclusion? And in order to explain that, I'm gonna explain two different key words. First is why is the addy? And the second is story. First, why is the addy refers to what you see is all there is. What that means is that our system one jumps to a conclusion based on the most recent memory that we have of that certain instance. And the second point is story. So for our system one, the actual factual background of whatever is going through our mind does not really be important. What is really important for system one is whether it makes sense to us, the story. For example, if I failed my biology class when I was in high school and I couldn't give a damn about, you know, the environment or anything, and the most recent article that I read just so happens to be in Breitbart or something talking about um, climate change being a hoax, and that's the only point of reference that I have in my head, then that will be my most recent memory of that instance on climate change. True, I might have heard something saying that it might not be a hoax, but that's my system too, that's my logical part, it's somewhere back there, it's hidden. 
if, for example, somebody asks me a question on climate change, what do you think about that? If my system too does not stop myself, then I'll just blurt out, oh, it's a hoax made by, you know, the government or something like that. And that becomes true for me because first, it makes sense. And second, it's the most recent memory that I have of that instance. So remember, the easier it is to actually extract a memory about a certain instance, it, there's a very high likelihood that this is more of an intuitive or instinctive response rather than a factual response. So be careful. So the second reason why we make stupid decisions at time is because our system two, our deliberate system two, is unable to stop our system one from jumping to a conclusion. And this happens mainly in two occasions. First, because our system two is too tired, or because our system two is too relaxed. Just think about this. Um, imagine it's midterm or final season, and you have your bloodshot eyes. It's three in the morning. You're hungry. You can't actually read the text in front of you. You're just tired. Do you think you could actually make a fair? objective judgment in that situation? Probably not, right? Or imagine a situation where you're so completely relaxed when you're high on weed, or I don't know, you're just completely laid back and chill. Do you think you'd be able to judge something fairly when you're in that state? Probably not either. So make sure that next time you make a very important decision in your life, that your system two is alert. And also have in mind that your system one is there. Don't ignore the fact that you have a system one because that's the biggest mistake that you could ever make. Ignoring that system one actually exists. Ignoring that system one is actually a part of you that wants to jump to a conclusion but without being filtered by system two. Now you might be thinking, Bruh, this is all gibberish, you know, system one, system two, what are you talking about? I'm smarter than that, I can judge, I can control my system one, system one doesn't control me, I am the owner of my own mind. But do you really think so? And just to test that, I'm gonna give you four different examples to prove you wrong, and that your system one is actually more powerful than you actually think. Okay, so let's start. Guess what this word is on the screen while I get something to eat. I'm starving. Okay, so. Did you guess the word? Was the word soup? If so, congratulations. You fall into what is known as the priming effect. This is not food. This is nothing. I just primed you to think of food. So you could actually guess the word soup instead of soap. So think about it. If I instead was rubbing my face with something or was washing myself, then the word that you would have guessed would not be you, but an A and you would guess soap instead of soup. So this is what's interesting about the priming effect is that I can make you think something without you even realizing that you thought something. The second is the halo effect. And let me just read out the traits of these two people, Alan and Ben. So Alan is intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, envious. And Ben is envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, and intelligent. Now, if you had a choice to become friends with one of them, who would it be? You probably chose Alan over Ben. What's really interesting is that they're the same adjective used to describe these two people, just that one is in an order that is contrary or the opposite of the other. This is what is known as the halo effect. When we think about somebody in a positive light, then whatever else that that person does, it is seen in a positive light. Whereas if we don't like somebody, then whatever good thing that person ever does, you don't really like it regardless. So next time you actually think about something, let's say about a politician, about a policy, about whatever that go is going around you, have in mind, is it because you really don't like this person based on what he actually did in the past? Or is it because of something more recent that you didn't like about and that was creating a halo effect on an entire person? Now the third example, I'll just launch it uh, in the form of a question. What do you think is the percentage of African countries listed in the United Nations? Do you think it's above 10%? I'll give you five seconds. Okay, I think that's about five seconds. Now, if I can guess your number, it probably was in between 10% and 35%. If I was correct, you fell for the anchor effect. Now, remember I said, do you think it's above 10%? And you probably listened to that and you just, you know, probably didn't think much about it. But what happened there, if your guess number was in fact between 10% and 35%, was that your mind subconsciously anchored to the 10% number. So it didn't really go that far. 
See, the answer, the real answer, is 52%. But you would have never thought of actually going that far. Now, what's really interesting is that if I, for example, said, do you think it's below 65%, then you would have gone from, let's say, 10 to 35% to 65% to 50 or 40%. So there is an anchor effect there. So next time you're in a situation where, you, for example, you're negotiating, to sell, let's say, your your phone. You want to sell your phone, and you think it's at least worth a hundred dollars, right? And you come to the table, and you know you're you're thinking, I'm gonna sell this phone for hundred dollars, right? And right before you're about to say anything, the other person says, I want fifty dollars for that phone. You know? Then what you actually need to do in that situation is get up, and then say, I am not going to continue this negotiation with that table on the number. I want it rid. I don't want it. I want to start over again. And the reason why you have to do that is because as soon as that number $50 lands on the table, then that becomes your reference point, that becomes your anchor. And the last experiment is my favorite experiment. It's called the pencil experiment. I just actually made that up, but pencil experiment. So depending on how you hold this pencil in your mouth, your mood changes. So for example, if you, if you hold on to like this, then automatically you have a shiny face. And that apparently lifts your mood and it helps you become very relaxed in a sense. However, if you hold the pencil this way, you understand, right? The reason why I really love this experiment is it shows how simple us humans are. If we smile, then we feel better. So our emotions follow our facial expression. If we frown, then we become sad and everything that we do from that point on becomes or feels more negative. So today I talked about why we make such stupid decisions at times. And the reason was that our system one jumps to an irrational conclusion and our system two is unable to stop that system one from making that conclusion. So there are two key messages that I want to get across to you. And the first is take your time. And the second message is don't be overconfident. The reason why I say take your time is because most likely when you want to just burst out with a reply, that's not you speaking, that's not your rational self speaking, but your system one. And the problem is that as soon as you, you know, say that, and even though your system two later comes and says you shouldn't have done that, it's already out there, you've already made the mistake. And there's actually nothing that you can do about it once it's out. You can actually say, oh, I'm sorry, that was really irrational or that was very crass of me, but that's too late. That per the other person would have already been hurt or already been thinking that you're a bit crazy or just a bit, you know, off the rocks. And the second thing is, therefore, don't be overconfident. Most likely, the answer that you know is half-baked and you don't actually know what you're really talking about most times. And I speak this out of uh, personal experience at times. So... Take your time and therefore don't be overconfident because there's a likelihood of you saying something that you don't really mean or saying something that you really didn't think about properly in the past. Okay, so this will be the end of the first half of the video and the second part of the video will be talking about whether we like pleasure as much as we dislike pain and how that factors into our decision process. And the second part is also will be about the two selves in us and how these two actually disagree. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. So if you like this video, please click the like button below and click the subscribe button and that will really make my day. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.